Hello everyone, uh, my name's Tito, my pronouns are he, him, and I currently work as head of front-end engineering at Babylon Health. Um, if you haven't heard of Babylon, we are an AI and data-based healthcare company, so we use clever maths to try and improve patient outcomes. Um, you can follow me on Twitter if you like. Uh, I'm here exclusively because I love attention, so please do. And, um, and just a kind of a word of warning, uh, if it sounds like I'm being patronizing at some point, it's not a comment on the intelligence of this particular audience. It's just that I used to be a school teacher, and I'm very used to talking to children. So apologies in advance. So I'm going to ask everybody to close their eyes. And we're here to talk about teams. So I want you to think back to a time when you were doing your best teamwork. Maybe that's a software project. Maybe it's organizing a holiday. But this is a time when everyone was playing to their strengths. Everyone felt safe to say what needed to be said. Everyone could acknowledge where they needed help. Everyone was growing. Anyone use um, Headspace, by the way? This is like the meditation app you ordered off wish.com. So think about how that felt at the time. And think about how you were all behaving towards each other. And think about who emerged as leaders. How did they behave? And everybody open your eyes. I'm guessing you were all picturing this. Am I right? <laughs> so hands up if you, if, you, uh, if you know what this is in the audience. Great, yeah. So this is a racy chart. And it's a pretty simple idea, and if you work in you know, a bigger organization, you've probably seen one. But the idea is, is that for every task that needs to be done, then you're going to say, who is responsible, accountable, consulted, or informed when it comes to that task? And those words are quite strange. Uh, I think consulted and informed are easy to get your head around, right? So informed means uh, please send me updates on this thing. And consulted means please ask for advice before doing something here. But I think responsible and accountable are a bit weird. And so we're going to dive into those. Did some Googling. And uh, found this, Project Smart. So responsible is the person who performs an activity or does the work. Accountable is the person who is ultimately accountable and has yes slash no slash veto. So ignore that, you know, accountable, ignore that that's a circular definition, that's going to come up a lot. Um, but it's going to, it, it does teach us something here, right? So it teaches us that the person doing the work can be different from the person who is accountable for the work. So accountabilities must be different to doing things. It also tells us that the accountable person seems to have some power in this relationship. They get to say yes, no, or veto. I don't know how veto is different from no, but they get to choose between those three things. Here's another one. This is from uh, Workfront. And more specifically, should any issues arise during the course of project delivery, is it the project manager who is by default the one who needs to pay the ultimate price for the failure, or is this issue a bit more complicated than that? Pay the ultimate price. I think this is an important aspect of accountability. It's whose head can we chop off? And I used to work with a guy, Craig Bass. I don't know if anyone's been lucky enough to work from him, with him, fantastic guy. And uh, in the pub, he summarized this to me as, uh, it's kind of like a manager saying, okay, I'm happy for you to play with this blameless teams thing, but who can I blame when things go wrong? More Googling. So we've got the idea of yes, no, veto again. But then also this idea that only one accountable person can be assigned to an action. And this idea keeps coming up when you read about these things. It seems to be absolutely central to this idea of accountability that you can only have one accountable person assigned to an action. But is that true? Think back to your best team effort. Was it super clear whose head you would chop off if that effort failed? 
And you know, life is messy, so I suspect we'll have a mixture of answers in the room. So I guess, um, put your hands up if uh, you planned in advance whose head you would chop off in the case of failure. No one? Uh, hands up if you, you sort of knew it, but you didn't make it explicit. Couple. And uh, hands up if you weren't thinking that way at all. Right, most people. And yet, this rule is treated as so sacred. So, let's take a sniff. So, in programming, there's this idea of a code smell. And that's the idea that when you're writing code and you see something that's not necessarily wrong, but is a good reason to double check. So, an example is comments in code. So, some people consider them to be a code smell. A comment is just a piece of code that doesn't do anything. So, you can use it to put some English description of what you're trying to do or something like that. And they say it's a code smell because good code should be self explanatory. Now, that doesn't mean that comments are always wrong. It's easy to imagine a circumstance where that's the right trade-off. But they're wrong often enough that we can call them a smell. And just like a smell in your house, it's worth investigating. You know, maybe it's harmless, but maybe it's a block drain that you should sort out. So here are some code smells that I picked up around this idea. This is the first one. You can read this stuff for hours, and it's all just received wisdom. And why? Everybody's saying this as if they're saying that the sky is blue, but it's not obvious at all to me that it has to be true. And why can't people explain and demonstrate what they're talking about in something that looks a bit like my context? Now, that's only a smell, because it could be that I've just worked on terrible teams, right? But it's a good reason to double check. Here's my next smell, uh, important LinkedIn business boys. So everyone writing about this stuff is one of those men who shares success memes and writes about how they're such a compassionate leader because they once held back from demolishing an orphanage or something. <laughs> and nobody I can find writing about this is building software, much less building collaborative software teams. So that's my second smell. And the third one is, is that it doesn't actually describe the best teams I've worked on. And I've worked right there in the deepest caves of bureaucracy, as well as the startup world. And the best teams I were on weren't doing this. And you know, I don't mean that they don't have notions of points of accountability, right? I just think that they didn't put it front and center. So if I think back to those teams, uh, if everybody was huddled around a whiteboard or mobbing or something, and someone came in and said, who is the accountable individual for this work? I think they'd need a few minutes to think it through, because it wouldn't have occurred to them. That's not how they were thinking about their own work. So analogies help to explain things. And uh, I found many, again, on LinkedIn. So here's the first one, Star Wars. So uh, when the Empire is trying to destroy the rebellion, Darth Vader is accountable for that, but the stormtroopers are responsible for it. So the stormtroopers actually do the work. You know, they're all small cogs in the machine, they're disposable, but Darth Vader's important. He doesn't actually do the work, but he's accountable for it. So, you know, he uses a corporal and capital punishment to get everyone else in line. Second good analogy here, which I think tells us a lot about this, is the factory floor. So when you have line workers in a factory, um, they're actually doing the work. But each part of the work isn't really valuable without the rest. So you need someone else to take ownership of it end to end. And that's what the kind of factory supervisor system is, right? Like it doesn't matter if an individual work, worker is uh, sick or is lazy or is unskilled, the supervisor has to find a way to make up for that. And lastly, the army. So individual soldiers in the army are responsible for doing the work, but ultimately they've got a commanding officer who's accountable for what gets done. And I think these are the most compelling and clear explanations for the difference between accountability and responsibility. As a result, they're the most widely shared ones. But these organizations have something in common, don't they? The first thing is that they don't ship software or any other kind of creative output. 
And the second one is, is that they rely on strong hierarchies and trying to separate the interests of more economically valuable from less economically valuable contributors. And I think the Star Wars one is particularly enlightening. So here's my final code smell for this idea. When the best explanation of an idea you can find is how you can use that idea to direct a slave army to conduct an intergalactic genocide, tread carefully. <laughs> and it reminds me a bit of this book. Uh, this is a book by um, Frederick Taylor, published in 1911. And what he's doing in this book is he's really crusading against the inefficiencies that he sees in factories. So to him, you've got all these people in the factories, and they are doing things by rule of thumb, and uh, they see themselves as having a craft. But, according to Taylor, um, only one of them is right about the best way to do it. So you should find the absolute best way, and then make everyone do that. So an example is, you know, think about how often you take a break. So if you have fewer breaks, that might mean you get more work done. But that also might mean that you get tired sooner. So it could be counterproductive. So there should be a scientific answer to the question, how often should a steel worker take a break, and how long should that break be? And you know, this book's got a bit of a, a bad rep these days. And um, I can tell that, I, I was hoping to bring a copy as a prop, but I forgot. But I can tell that, firstly, because the only copy in print I could find has the author's name dripping in blood, uh, and also because the publisher felt it necessary to start the book with an essay about how this book has become so unpopular because of the Nazis. So think of that, what you will. And according to this guy, uh, factory workers are really stupid. right? So when he's paraphrasing them, he does it in broken English, uh, and in like a Swedish accent, um, when he wants to express their point of view. And I think it's worth calling out that if this is your mindset, then of course you need different people to be responsible and accountable, right? You've got a bunch of people that you think are a bit thick and interchangeable, and one person who you think is a bit less thick. So you need a system to help everyone understand that there's a difference between doing work and being accountable for work. And I think that that idea is totally inseparable from that mindset. So are we factories in software teams? I mean, you can model it a bit like a factory, right? So you could see it that the programmers are kind of like the line workers, and the code is your product. But I don't think that's right. I think it's more like we're designing factories, right? So source code is almost like the specification for the factory itself. So when we write source code, we're writing instructions on how to build something. So it's almost like we've given ourselves the power to construct a single use factory that will spit out the actual product, which is software, and you know, holiday bookings and payment verification and whatever value you're delivering. And I think this tells us something about the, the whole endeavor of trying to organize people's work in that way. So the first one is you think about, well, why doesn't Frederick Taylor propose scientific management as a way to improve his own work, right? How often should he take breaks while he's writing that book? And why is he given the freedom to think creatively, but no one else is? And who's responsible, accountable, consulted, and informed when it comes to the decision to use a racy matrix itself? Who has veto power over that person's work? And when we see these attitudes, we know there must be someone that gets to decide those rules. That person gets to be an entrepreneur who can't have their judgment creativity stifled by micromanagement. So again, think back to that best team. And were you more like the type of workers who get to change the rules, who get to proudly act like craftspeople, or were you expected to blindly follow a system that's the, pattern of, that's the product of someone else's entrepreneurialism? I say that we're not line workers, and our work is fundamentally creative. So, is it all bad? I don't think so. I think it's just a word that is used to mean a bunch of different things at once, and some of them are bad, and probably they're not all going to be useful in the same context. There's glimpses of good ideas here. And the first one's ownership, right? It is good to take ownership, and when a person, or better yet, a group of people say, no matter what, we're going to fix this for someone. That's good, right? And I think there's a reason that management consultants talk about accountability as if it's a counterpoint to blame. 
And that's because that attitude of ownership is obviously better than, you know, in retrospect, trying to figure out whose job was what. But I guess I'd argue that that racy matrix weakens ownership. It says, here's where my job starts, or my job ends, and your job begins. When things go wrong, you know, you can look at that matrix, and it helps you answer the question, who should have done this? But that's never the most important question, is it? The most important questions to ask are, how did we get into this situation, and what should we do next? And, you know, delegation and specialization, that makes sense, right? We do it often. We aren't bees, and it makes sense to record that in some way because we just have different skills and sometimes specialist roles. So sometimes we have to coordinate the specialist outputs between different people. But you don't actually need to introduce the idea of the ultimate price to do that, right? Like we coordinate all the time, and, um, and, and we don't use that sort of that, that threat to do it. And performance management. So clearly that needs to happen. And you know, performance management obviously is not blameless or non-judgmental, and it can harm psychological safety. But I think paradoxically, you do kind of need an element of performance management to achieve collective responsibility, because people need to trust they can depend on some sort of baseline of stability if you really want them to lean into the system. And you know, yes, yeah, sometimes you do need to figure out who's going to pay the ultimate price, right? If, uh, what happens if your financial software facilitates fraud? Someone's going to jail. Who's it going to be? And I think crucially, though, you don't need to do this for every single thing you want to be effective. And uh, you should think of this as a sort of scary tool that the lawyers sometimes make you use. I think if, if you don't believe me about that, um, try doing this in a more sort of uh, consensual setting. So if you're here with your colleagues, after the talk, uh, go outside and buy them a coffee, then turn to them and say, next time, I'm holding you accountable for buying the coffee, right? It won't go down well, because that's not how people who trust each other communicate with each other. So what does ownership look like here? What can it look like? I like to think it can kind of look like a jazz band. So, um, you know, Im imagine you're playing in an orchestra, first of all, and uh, you're all there, you're ready to play a symphony, and uh, someone else plays the part that you were assigned. You'd be upset, wouldn't you? You'd say, uh, hey, I was the responsible actor in this plan. You were merely informed. But in a jazz band, that's not what happens at all, right? You listen to what they're doing, you figure out how it changes the rules of what you're creating, and then you play along with what they're doing. And I think that creative teams always have to sort of operate in this way. You know, they need to be improvised. Our roles have to be flexible. You almost want them to be so flexible that you never write them down. And you certainly don't want to define someone's value by the outputs you expect them to have at the start of a process. And I think we need to be kind of customer focused in the same way that a jazz band is, right? In that none of this matters if the music doesn't sound good. Who cares about this line-by-line -line summary of who isn't doing their job or who is doing their job uh, if it all sounds bad or if your product isn't delivering value? And that's kind of why we do this agile thing in the first place, right? It's because we know the plan is wrong at the start, and so the only question we care about is how do we respond when we learn it's wrong? It's never quite the same song, but it has to sound good. So we're going to talk about a couple of techniques which uh, I hope will help you to rip up some racy charts in your organization. So what do you do when you need to specialize, right? So obviously we, or many teams, strive to have uh, a completely collective view of everything. But, you know, we're not bees and someone's going to be good at design and someone's going to be good at setting technical direction. And occasionally, we're going to give people a special hat to wear to do that. So here's how I did this on a recent team. The situation was that we had something of an isolated team who were tasked to experiment to decide whether or not to move our mobile apps from native app development into React Native. And 
The team's work at that point was fairly easy to understand, right? There were some technical challenges, of course, but largely we're replicating functionality in an existing project. So everybody knew more or less what had to be done. But now we needed to take this live to the organization. And so we also need to think about how are we going to build the right development platform for other teams to engage uh, in, in this new way of working? So to do this right, we needed more product thinking. Uh, we needed to change our ways of working up. Uh, and so you know, we ended up having more hats in the team, um, a product manager, tech lead, an engineering manager, etc. And I was worried initially about these roles coming into conflict. right? So I think um, Babylon is not an organization where you can say, for every team, we have this super strict, strict definition of where the EM stops and where the, the PM starts, for example. And so I didn't really want people to be treading on each other's toes in that way. But I also didn't want to kind of elevate these roles above the team by strictly defining them, right? Because I think if your boss's boss comes to you with a racy diagram and says, this is now your job, you'll probably stick to doing that. So I wanted the teams to be more dynamic, uh, take ownership of their processes collectively, and you know, I kind of firmly believe that if a team wants to be able to change something about its process, then it should be able to do that. So this is what I decided to do instead. So for each role, I decided to draft a short statement. Um, and the short statement, for it, it will never say what someone will do. But instead, it will talk about how this person will realize value through the team. So here's one we came up with for a tech lead. We said that the tech lead is going to, uh, uh, the, the value added is that the team knows what it means to build something the right way and is empowered to continuously improve its engineering practices. So why do I prefer this to a racy diagram? First and most important reason, it's faster and it's more fun to write. Secondly, um, I like that it doesn't say what someone's gonna do because I think that should always be a team call, right? The team should have absolute power to change its ways of working. And I also like that not focusing on specific tasks means that you don't tie an individual's value to those tasks. And that means um, you are not incentivizing them to kind of cling to this special role. So we can imagine the possibility that every activity that we're doing in these special roles today might be improved or made redundant without hurting anybody's ego. I like that it's a, a more positive message, right? It's not thinly veiled frets. It's, uh, it's a, a positive vision of what someone's going to add to a team dynamic. And I like that it doesn't conflate an individual's performance with a project outcome. So those things are connected, of course. So if everybody does a, a bad job, then there's probably going to be a bad outcome. Um, but you don't actually need to manage them at the exact same time, and certainly not with the same tools. Um, I liked that this was friendly to more junior, the, the growth of more junior team members. So this uh, allowed other team members to try specific tasks they hadn't tried before, and thereby increased resilience, right? So if you're telling somebody on your team, hey, it's your job to write stories, um, what happens when they don't write stories? Um, that, that's a failure. And if that's the case, they're gonna be more reluctant to allow other people to try that. And lastly, um, I like that they're accessible and readable to people who don't ever intend to listen to a management seminar. So that's tool one. Here is tool two. So you can do, you can do what I call a forensic racy, right? Which is that you're using this tool to find out what's likely to be broken in your organization. So draw up the racy for something you're doing, but you're not gonna use it prescriptively. So you're not taking this and saying, this is what you all must do. Instead, you're saying, this is my understanding of how we currently behave. So you know, I guess it's, it's a bit like documenting a crime scene. So when the police go and do that, they're not saying, this is how to conduct a better murder, right? They're saying, uh, this is what happened. So here's step one for how to do this. You draw this out, right? And you draw, try and get your best view of how we are currently behaving right now. 
And um, then first you look for accountability, responsibility, splits. So you can see there's one there between the project manager and the senior engineer. And you know when you see those, often that's not valuable. That's just a bottleneck. And, and think about it, think about whatever it is that you're responsible on your team. Do you, act, do, you, do you want someone else to be accountable for that? You know, presumably a non-expert in that task. Would that actually help you do a better job? I don't want that. And you know, ironically, I don't think anybody who's willing to take ownership wants that either. So when you find this, this is what you do. You just ask yourself, why can't the responsible person take ownership here? Ask that person directly, what would you need to take direct ownership of this thing? And better yet, ask, why can't the team collectively take ownership for this thing? So next you look for this. So look out for people um, who carry out multiple particular tasks. They've got a bunch of things that they and only they are responsible for. And what you'll find here is a bottleneck and a threat to your own resilience. Right? What's going to happen if this person wins the lottery or is hit by a bus? And you want to ask yourself, why can no one else do this task? Right? And, and maybe there's a good reason. You know, it's just a smell after all. So presumably, only the software engineers are going to write code. But maybe not. And challenge the whole team to figure out, is there a way that we can do this collectively? Or is there a way that we can even automate this away? And if the answer is really no, then keep it. Because remember, it's, it's only a smell. Maybe it is absolutely fine. Next up, you want to do this. So find the people who aren't informed of anything. Uh, how is this person doing their job? <laughs> so I think there's going to be one of two things happening whenever you see this. either this person is working in total ignorance of what everyone else is doing, and that's super dangerous, and you want to fix that. Or you didn't write it down because it was so kind of fluid and natural already. They're already working, communicating, collaborating seamlessly with the rest of the team, and in which case, you've probably found an easy opportunity to introduce some more collective ownership around a particular task. And then lastly, you want to look for this pattern. Um, you want to find the hippos. So um, this person here is not responsible for anything. They're not even consulted on anything or informed on anything for another task. And like, there's no nice way to say this, but that's not a job, right? <laughs> this is just somebody inserting themselves into your process um, and not adding anything. And you know, probably this person is very clever. Um, but if you really can't find anything at all that they actually do, then think about moving them to be more of an arm's length stakeholder. Right? You keep them in the loop and you get advice from them, but you don't want them involved in the day-to-day decision-making of the team. Right? By definition, the only thing this person can contribute is micromanagement. So what do you do? So you talk to them um, and, and, and you know, keep them in the loop if they really need to know this stuff, meaningfully and less frequently, um, you know, maybe you get feedback from them every two weeks um, and free them up to do something else. If, if they really are so, so clever that uh, they can take on all this accountability, then I'm sure there are plenty of other things around the organization that they can be fixing. So that's what I normally do um, with that racy diagram. And I'm hoping that that helps you challenge some of the accountability in your own organization. I'm going to stop there and see if anyone has any questions. Go ahead. Good. Yeah, it's a great question. I'm going to repeat the questions. The question is, if you're trying to get people to express uh, the value canvas in terms of their value add through the team, um, do you ask that person to do it, or do you do it for them? Or ask the team. Or ask the team to do it, yeah. So um, I'm going to be honest. So when I did this, I did it for them. right? And the reason was is that, um, that I sort of made it up, right? 
So I just kind of wanted everyone to know what I was talking about. But it was important to me that there was some sort of aspect of team control there. And so firstly, I called up those individual people and I said, hey, you know, this is kind of, this is how I see, you know, what you're adding. Do you agree with that? And we went back and forth a little bit and tweaked them, especially in the areas that aren't kind of, you know, my direct uh, expertise, like product. Um, and then we also went to the teams as well and said, you know, does this make sense? I guess I, I like to think that if you were in a team that was evolving, um, ev evolving gradually into doing this versus the result of a, like a, a massive change of direction like we were, maybe this is a discussion you have with the team at the point you choose to introduce a role. So does the team itself get to say, hey, things are now complicated enough that we would like a QA or a QE or a product manager? And if so, you know, what are they going to do? What's their value add? So that would feel like the more natural way. Um, and I think if I were to repeat it, I would err on being more democratic than I was when I did it. Go ahead. Fantastic question. So the question was, um, how do people's individual personalities and approaches uh, interact with this? So is it, uh, you know, was this different for different kind of personalities or did this kind of change the personalities that were there? So and it's a question that's hard for me to answer because I think that, you know, maybe to some people it is very important to them that they have s strong stability around the particular actions they're taking. But I think those people if they were working for me, would have quit long ago. They would find me so annoying, wouldn't they? And so it's hard for me to answer. Um, but, yeah, I'd be curious to hear, um, you know, if anybody else has an experience where they've tried to do this and someone said, actually, I want to be here 9 to 5 and do X, Y, Z. Um, that would be interesting. Go ahead. Um, what advice would you give to an entirely new team? Okay, his question was, um, what advice would you give to a new team that hasn't worked together before and doesn't have that trust yet? Yeah, this is, this is an interesting question. So I think that that team probably isn't going to be kind of taking ownership of their process in the same way, um, so, because that kind of means that you need to be ready to, to fail in front of each other, right? So uh, I suppose you almost need to take as a baseline that you have some people who are working together and who are happy to you know, show up at a retrospective and say, actually, that didn't work, and, um, you know, in a, in, in a blameless way, we're going to change it. Um, so there's those words, aren't there, that all rhyme, storming and norming and something. And I think you probably need to be at least halfway up that before you even start uh, trying to do this, I think. Um, but I haven't tried it, so pinch of salt there. Do we have any other questions? Go ahead. Could you maybe share an example of uh, like a super specialized role like that? Yeah, that's interesting. So the question was um, basically, um, how, how do you handle teams that have super specialized roles? So for example, where people aren't full stack engineers, but instead just handle a particular piece of the tech stack. So I think it's obviously, it's going to be hard to have any sort of collective ownership of your process in that situation. But that's probably not the worst problem. The worst problem is, is that no one actually gets to solve anything, right? So um, I mean, even just something as fundamental as a user story, so if you're right, if you put up a user story and it says, you know, as a, uh, suddenly my mind's gone blank about anything that humans do in the world, 
Um, as, as a patient, I want to check my symptoms so that I know uh, if I should call a doctor or not. Um, well, to me, like, the reason why we express our work in that way is because we want to keep focused on what we're trying to do for that person, right? And so in that world, no, no one's ever going to do that, right? So somebody's job is going to be complete, and yet that patient cannot check their symptoms. Um, so it feels like it's, I don't know, that it's pretty super opinionated, but I, I, I would tend not to do that, except for where there's a super complex subsystem and it's avoidable, um, then I would normally err on saying, let's try to be full stack. And if that's really hard, maybe we should simplify our tech stack. And let's try to make it so that when I say something is done, that means something changed in the customer's world as opposed to changed in the world of the person who can then make a change in the world of the person who can make a change for the customer. Um, so that, that would be normally what I'd be trying to do there. Okay. I think that's everyone. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day.